So today, our second talk is being given by Zachary Anderson. He's technically a junior at the University of Connecticut. He's been one of our very, very avid members of the club. Uh, he has been here, what do we say, for two years? Is that right? Two or two and a half-ish? I think it's going to be like two after this year. Okay, two years after this year. The club uh, was only founded about uh, two years and eight months ago um, when I was... I guess that would make it when I was either an early sophomore or a late freshman. I can't remember specifically. I'd have to check the actual date, but um, yeah, Zach uh, Zach has been working in Unity. He's been doing stuff with Pyrebug, um, and he's currently a CS student. Uh, and today he's going to be telling us about what it's like to build a 3D character controller in Unity. So I'm going to hand the floor over to him, um, and yeah, we'll have questions at the end. So uh, yeah, like like he said, my name is Zach Anderson. That that is my name. Um, I'm just gonna put out a disclaimer that uh, I'm not a professional game designer. None of this stuff that you may see in here is guaranteed to be best practice. Um, there are probably better ways to do it, but it's my it's my code. It's my little baby, and I'm kind of proud of it. Uh, also, it has been a hot minute since I've worked on the stuff I'm going to be showing, so I might not, like, be able to remember everything, um, just because, you know, it's almost been a year, uh, so apologies if I, like, can't answer a question or something, um, but yeah, so with that in mind, let's, uh, get right into the presentation, uh, so as it turns out, Unity already has something called a character controller, so, you know, Presentation over. There we go. It's done. Except, of course, not. Um, nothing's ever that simple in Unity. Uh, ever. And the character controller is actually kind of... It, does, it, it doesn't do what we say, want the character control say. I cannot speak. Sorry. Um, it's not enough on its own, basically. Um, however, there are are a couple things that um, it's good for, because yeah, why would they put it in if it wasn't good for anything? Um, so here's the character controller. You've got a bunch of different stuff. Uh, right here you've got a slope limit, which makes it so that um, when your character is like climbing up stuff, they can't like just walk up a mountain. Cause that's a little bit silly. You've got the step offset, so that your character can climb stairs and not get like stuck. And the center radius and height, these all affect the um, the cylinder collider. No, not the cylinder collider, sorry. The capsule collider that is built in to the character controller, which is kind of neat. However, by far the most important part of this component here is the move function. Now, the move function takes into vector3 as an argument and moves the character... Uh, sort of pretty similar to transform.translate. It just, you know, moves them in the world space. But what makes this cool um, is that unlike, unlike transform.translate, um, the character will stop when they hit a wall. Uh, so you can actually, like, use it to move around in your levels and stuff. And it's pretty cool. No need to implement hit detection. It's, it's just there. Fantastic. All right, so... Uh, now that that object stuff's out of the way, it's time for code. Um, yeah. Uh, if you don't like code, well, that's tough, buddy. Because um, video games are made of code. Gonna be honest. Wait, wait, wait. Video games are made of code? Yes. Oh, my God. Sorry to break it to you. I'm gonna make a phone call. <laughs> All right. Now, the first step when you're, like, constructing a script that this is the character controller, is you're going to want to, like, have some stuff to move the camera around. So as you can see, here's a bunch of code, right? Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't entirely know why all the stuff in this code is the way it is, because I didn't make this. I stole this from my boss. Um, his code had more words and stuff, and I was like, wow, that's neat. I'm taking that. And so I did. Are you talking about me? Yes. Oh, my God. Uh, but yeah, so, um, but the gist of it, basically, is that you want to take in 
um, some sort of like input from either like the right stick or your mouse movement. And um, you want to rotate your camera that you attach to your player object um, up and down based on the Y input. And you want to rotate the entire character um, based on the X input. Um, so like you look at, so when, you, when you're looking up and down, like your guy doesn't lean stuff because that wouldn't be, uh, that'd be weird. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now that we have the camera out of the way, uh, we move on to step two, which is actually making the, uh, the little guy move. All right, so there's a lot of stuff in this big old chunk of code here. So let's break it down piece by piece. Um, this first part right here with the theta and all this angle sh stuff, um, what this is doing is it's taking the, uh, like the rotation of the um, player object and like, you know, just figuring out, like, comparing it to the input and saying, like, hey, uh, what direction is the player going if we hold forward, basically? Um, you know, because, like, if you don't do this, then, like, if you just pass in the input to the move function, um, you're, like, when you hold forward, your character's going to go, like, north. But when you turn, you want them to go forward, because going forward makes you go forward in most video games. Uh, so that's why this is here. Uh, yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, uh, next we have... All right, okay, so speed run time. Um, this block of code right here, uh, if the player's in the air, we use lerp, which um, what we do is we take like the input that the player's getting, that's like the desired, like that's the goal, and we take the current momentum of the player, and we, like kind of move it towards that direction. So it makes it feel like the, if the player's like ha is in the air, they have a little bit more weight. Um, like, you know, Mario, if you like hold left while you're jumping, it does, he doesn't just like snap on a dime. So that's why this is here. And then right down here, we just multiply the horizontal momentum by the speed um, to make the player go fast. Down here, we've got gravity and stuff, um, which is important in a, you know, 3D game where you, like, there's verticality. Uh, and it's just, like, standard gravity stuff, you know. Add gravity. Yeah. That's, like, yeah, it, that's what happens in real life. You just add, add the gravity. Um, I also put a little, like, uh, max thing right here to make sure that the player's, like, speed never, like, goes too high when they're going down. Because I feel like that could cause problems. Uh, I haven't encountered anything like that, though. And then down here, we finally pass um, the final like movement that's been calculated to the controller.move uh, function. And it moves the player, and the player goes, and this happens every single frame, and everybody's happy. Um, you'll notice time.delta time appears in a couple things. Uh, you want to use that if you have stuff in the update function, because it makes it... Um, so that your calculations are uh, independent of the frame rate. So that means uh, little Timmy with his, like, you know, uh, poopy game area laptop from, like, 2013 can still run the game, like, all right. And it doesn't just, like, completely break. Yeah. Uh, next step. Um, yeah. Now... If your game isn't, like, focused on, like, moving and stuff, if you want to just do, like, a witness sort of thing or, like, return to the Oberdin, then your, like, movement code basically stops there. But if you want to be rad and put jumps, you can put in jumps. That's nice. Um, so right here is a little simple little piece of math. Um, but basically, we can specify like the height that we want the player to jump, and using this math, um, it sets their vertical velocity to exactly what it needs to be to reach that height, which is cool. Um, it is cool, you know, but this, this, little, this little jump right here, I wasn't satisfied. I wanted to get more complicated. So I did all this. Um, now in this big chunk of stuff right here, uh, this is where I calculate wall jump things, and down here is just the double jump. Double jump's pretty easy, 
just have a bowl say if like hey if they can still double jump and cool and then it just makes them jump again change the slide all right um cool so as i was saying before technical difficulties were technical um that big meaty chunk of code in the middle of this uh slide is the wall jump stuff so what i do basically is i send out um I, I loop over a, an array of like directions to send out a bunch of raycasts, and if one of them hits the wall, I get the data from that, like the normal vector and stuff, and um, I I make the, I'm like, hey, code, make them jump, because jump, yeah, um, and like I, I <laughs> sorry, so you can see down there, um, it says if ray hit, and then it has that those two little lines um that's what's actually happening when the player wall jumps um speaking of that uh the little add velocity function there josh if you will um this function right here uh is i made it specifically to handle the horizontal momentum changes due to wall jumps um the math here looks complicated that's because it is um when i started implementing the wall jumps i had like a clear idea of how i wanted the horizontal momentum to be handled i wanted the player to maintain any momentum they had parallel to the wall um but then have their momentum perpendicular to it be set to a specific value like you know like um five meters per second or whatever like away from the wall um unfortunately there are no brackies tutorials directly related to this so I had to kind of bang my head against the keyboard until this miraculously showed up. And to be completely honest, I don't fully understand it myself. Um, but, like, I understand what it does, though. It takes, it basically zeroes out the, um, like, the momentum perpendicular to the wall, like I said. And then it takes the uh, direction of the normal vector given to it by the function call earlier and adds that to the horizontal momentum. Um, now, all this math was, wouldn't actually be necessary if I had just said, hey, I'll make all my walls, like, you know, like, they either go north, east, south, or west. Um, but because I was like, oh, like, ho, ho, I want slanted walls, I had to do this. Um, but it works now, and that's cool. Um, all right, Josh, next one. All right, now all this stuff, all this code's cool, but you gotta put limits on stuff. You can't just have the player jump in whenever. That's gonna cause problems. They're gonna see the stuff that you've hidden and like the secret stuff. Yeah, you don't want that. So you gotta put in checks to make sure, like you know, the player's on the ground, or like if they're if they use their double jump, stuff like that, and that's what this is. Um, so at the top uh, is where I check the if the player is grounded. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, the first method I used was a uh, physics dot check sphere, which just you know like checks to see if there's something within like a certain radius of a of a point, and that's neat. Um, it's probably like doesn't take too much computation stuff. Uh, but the problem is you don't really get a lot of information from that, only if there's a yeah, no. So if you wanted to know, for example, like the slope of the ground that you're standing on, um, if you wanted to like make you the player slide, you have to do something else. Um, and a ray, a ray cast will give you that, but since ray casts are infinitely like thin, um, it causes problems if like the player's hanging off of a ledge or if there's like a hole in the ground, because the raycast will just slip through. So the ideal solution is a sphere cast, which has the best of both worlds. It's big, it's chunky, it tells you what you need to know. And that's cool. Now, once we have whether or not the player is grounded, we can set a bunch of other bulls, like, um, you know, whether they can jump, um, like if their momentum's being interpolated or not, stuff like that. It's also very helpful to, um, it's like, <laughs> thank you, Josh. It's also very helpful to have put a check in there to see um, if the player was grounded on the previous frame, because um, that essentially like we can figure out when the player lands or when they like leave the ground. Um, 
Uh, for example, when the player leaves the ground, but they're not jumping, um, I reset. I set the momentum, the vertical momentum, to be zero, um, because I, like you know, if you step on a ledge, off a ledge, you don't want the player. You don't want the player to shoot like straight down because the gravity's been accumulating. You want them to like you know fall. Um, and there's like other stuff here too for like a lot of things that I've like done over time. Um, that I'm not going to get into all of them because it's not enough time. Uh, but for example, there's the head bonk uh, bull, which basically I just check, hey, is there a ceiling above the head? If so, um, later on down the line, I can uh, like set the momentum, the vertical momentum to Y, so that like the you know you bonk your head and you fall down. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, here we have coyotes. Um, you may have noticed the term coyote appears in some of the code that I've shown uh, previously. Uh, I'll let you explain where this comes from. You see, uh, coyotes have the incredible ability to stand in midair as if they were on solid ground. Gamers across the world have utilized the power of coyotes to make normally impossible jumps. Um, however, in an effort to prevent the overexploitation of the coyotes, the U.S. government has placed limits on the amount of time the power of the coyote can be active which comes out to be only a fraction of a second per jump. For the player, this means that if the jump button is pressed just a tad too late, they can still jump normally as if nothing was wrong. This, phenomena, this phenomenon is known colloquially as coyote time. Uh, this code here is just a simple little coroutine that halts the power of the coyote a short time after the player has left the ground. Uh, also, credit to the developers of Celeste for, I think, I think they were the ones that coined that term. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, they're cool. It was the developers of um, Dead Cells who were building it because, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the developers of Dead Cells because... I, I think it's in um, both games. It is, it is in both games. Dead Cells invented it because yeah. originally Dead Cells was a platformer and tower defense, and players were having a lot of trouble getting from small platform to small platform because the jumps were awkward. So they just implemented Coyote Time, and it made it a lot easier. Yeah, it's weird, okay, right? Well, yeah, props to Dead Cells then. All right, uh, that's all for this slide, I think. All right. Now, I suspect that at this point in this presentation, you may be a little bit bored. I mean, there's only been, like, code and nothing else, right? Except for stock images, of course. You know, I, I can hear you now. Where's the drama? Where's the romance? Where's the betrayal? Now, fellas, I do have a story of betrayal. And conveniently enough, it also serves as a cautionary tale. So, you know, it's like a two-in-one thing. Uh, Josh? You see, I was conscript conscripted to work on a certain project at Pyrobook Studios. Uh, I was tasked with updating the character controller because it was stinky, and I did so with great gusto. All was well until one fateful day. After some time, my boss approached me, with Clint, Josh, that was too early. Um, <laughs> my boss approached me with claims that the character controller I made was acting funky. This is what we in the business call a problem. For some reason, the player character acted all jittery and wouldn't jump correctly. I spent days agono agonizing over my code, trying to figure out what was wrong with it. Eventually, I discovered something that shook me to my very core. All right now, Josh. Somebody had added a rigid body to my character controller behind my back, and they didn't even bother to turn off the gravity or make it kinematic. I was absolutely outraged that I had spent days trying to debug a problem that was one checkbox away from being solved. For those who aren't aware, we're still here, Josh. For those who aren't aware, rigid bodies are Unity's built-in way of simulating physics. But if you've been paying attention, We've already started simulating physics in the script I've made. So, when you have two things that are, like, trying to inflict gravity upon the player, things get a little, a little wonky. Um, for example, the ground check that was at the feet of the player, that's, it's supposed to be, you know, just right there, see if the ground's there. Um, it ended up, like, 20 meters below the player, just because, like, it was falling for whatever reason. 
and there was like other problems too. It just was a whole mess, and it could have all been avoided, but it's all good now. So just let this be a word of warning to anyone that dares make a character controller. First of all, don't use Unity's physics engine. Second of all, if you do use Unity's physics engine, make sure that your rigid bodies know their place, because they will bite you in the ass if you don't, you don't, you know, take care of them. All right, that's it for this slide. All right, so I just want to, this is the end of the presentation. I want to thank everybody for listening to me ramble on. Uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, um, go for it. I wrote the script in, around 4 in the morning, so there are probably things I've forgotten or, or that I could have explained better, so ask away. Uh, this is the part where you all unmute your mics and clap for Zach. Thank you, Zach. That was really fantastic. I loved, I loved, you sent me a message at, like, I think, what was it, really late at night, like, hey, can I add stock photos to my presentation? And I, I think it was like, of course, yes. And I, they really paid off. Some of my favorite ones were like, were, were this one. Where I, 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 this guy, this guy right here made me kind of, I kind of resonated with him. Like, right, this guy, he's just screaming, and there's just, like, all of this math, and you're like, and then when you, when you, this slide, when you're probably you right now, I just, like, I was just like, wow, this is emotive. Like, you really, you didn't just use stock photos, you, you actually went and found very specific ones, um. I also didn't realize why it was called Coyote Time until I saw this image. So I, I appreciate a lot that you were able to illustrate that. Um, yeah, I, I real I realized that like it might have been a little confusing to people that aren't actually familiar with the term. So I threw in Wiley Coyote there. That makes sense. Um, yeah, no, this this is great. I this is another one of my. I don't I don't know why. I don't know why you have these specific images. This one I guess makes the most sense, but like this one doesn't make any sense to me. And this no, one that's because is... I stole your code. Oh, right, right, of course. And honestly, like, I, I, this is, this is so old, but I remember writing it, and basically the whole point of doing all of this, like, because you're basically adjusting everything, like, three times. The mm. idea is that you're, you're attempting to get it to lock and be smooth, so you're not having this yeah. awkward adjustment, yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, this whole part with Minecraft Steve, I thought was a lot of fun. Where he's where he moves and then he does not move, and then this guy, I he is this <laughs> this this face just pointing to the move vector three function. I just thought was fantastic. Really great presentation. Thank you for coming out. Um, yeah, so I guess it is now this part with the betrayal. I I this is this just the story of of me and Rob spending a while trying to figure out what happened, and then you just saying why is there a rigid body. Is is that why Rob is here? Is that the yes? That's why Rob. Is Rob there. put yeah. Robert Linquist. I'm gonna just paste this in here so that we have it stored. All right, but yeah, no. Any questions about designing a character controller? Um, I I will give it to the floor here. Um, Josh, this is more a note to you as club president, but I'm changing my presentation in April from. Um, Dialogue to top ten stock images from Zach's presentation is going to be <laughs> my presentation now. Yeah, I, at the end of the uh, at the end of the the semester when we have our before our final meeting, um, I, what I'm actually going to do is make like a collage of of like of of all this of like a bunch of different little screenshots of and like you know just people's profile pictures and like you know all this stuff and this this panel right here. I think should definitely just get slapped in there somewhere, and I, I just I think it's great. Um, and yeah, no, definitely I would I would if we wanted to do like a voting thing for which other stock photos will go in, that would be a, a lot of fun too. Zach, quick question. Um, yes, sir. Who's controlling who? That is a question that I haven't found the answer to yet. I'm still on my journey, but I'll let you know when I find it out. Okay. I don't know. I just feel like it's kind of like misleading to call the presentation that and then not have an answer. Well, 
to be fair, I didn't come up with the name. I just went with the one that Josh made up, so. Oh. Yeah, mine was meant to be a placeholder. <laughs> well, I mean, I made the presentation, like, last minute, so I, you know, the I placeholder keep... was already, like, official. I keep staring into the heartless <laughs> eyes of Rob. <laughs> You will put put rigid bodies on your objects. It's funny because Rob had a nickname for a little while in in a, in one of the classes. He was Rob Rigid Boy uh, Lindquist, and that's because he was trying to type rigid body one day and just forgot to hit the to hit the D button. But yeah, great presentation. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Zachary? Okay. I I actually have, like, two questions, just because I feel like it'd yes. be fun for you to answer here. Um, what do you feel, when creating a character controller, what is, the, what is the most important contributor to the way that that controller feels? Um, probably, honestly, I think the thing that makes it feel the, like, it's probably between the jumping and then the... Actually, it's mostly just the jumping. Like, either it's up or down, or, like, like the interpolation. I think that is what makes, like... Like, at least when I, like, have when was making it, like... That was what stuck out to me as being, like, oh, this needs to be, like... This needs to feel right. Because, um, like... I don't know. <laughs> that's that's my answer. Um, no, that makes sense. Yeah, the, the lurping... The, the lurping of the momentum, I guess, yeah. No pun intended, but kind of bouncing off of that, um, when you are designing a character controller, whether it be 3D or 2D, do you feel that there is a level of difference that you have to take into account when building one for keyboard and mouse versus controller? Or do you think that, generally speaking, they should feel the same? Um, oh, like, you're talking about, like, like the end goal, you mean? Yeah, if like, they should if... feel different? Yeah, because I, I find that when I play Halo, for example, with a keyboard and mouse, first when I play Halo with a controller, the, the difference is noticeable beyond belief, right? Like, because when, when playing with a controller, there's a lot of stuff that you feel kind of limited with, right? Like, the, the sensitivity yeah. on a controller for Halo is 16 by 9 sensitivity. It's not 1 to 1 sensitivity. So your mm -hmm. vertical sensitivity is... is uh, <laughs> I guess six or nine sixteenths than it, your horizontal sensitivity because of the way that your monitor is shaped. But on PC, when you're playing yeah. with a mouse, it is it is it's if I like remember, it's one to one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like I don't know, like I guess um, it, it depends on what you're like, like trying to go for, like game wise. I guess um, like what you're. Should, can, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, do you think that when de basically when designing a character controller, do you take into account what control method the player is using? Um I mean, like yeah, like you you only need to like do it like at a certain point. Like I I personally like kind of like the 16 by 9 or whatever like ratio of like, when you're using the stick. Um I just think that feels nice when like doing that as opposed to like like, the one-to-one -one with the mouse. Um, I don't know, it just, like, that's... I like that better. But that you really only need to, like, focus that in, like, when you're getting the input. Like, you have you can have, like, two different, like, if the player's using the mouse, just do this, versus if they're using a controller, do this instead. Um, and then from there on, it, it just passes through, like, all the code, and, like, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you to everybody watching on YouTube. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. Um, uh, in the description of this video, there should